work on this case. Let me have um, the co-defendant come on up. Um, remind, I'm so sorry, Mr. Uh, Mr. Cohen, remind me his name. Uh, Baker, Judge. DeAndre. Baker. DeAndre. Right. Yeah, Judge, how are you? Can I, I'm doing great. How are you? Good, good to see you, Judge. All right, you too. Judge, All we right. can probably avoid some of the uh, uh, duplicative information that um, that was already stated. Uh, my client is charged with uh, four counts of, uh, of armed robbery, four counts of ag assault. Uh, ultimately, I think the ag assault will probably um, combine into the armed robberies. Uh, but that being said, uh, in regards to uh, Mr. Baker, we actually have uh, more affidavits than we provided to the state. And that was for uh, a little strategic uh, defense issue in case this case goes forward the witnesses uh, that uh, I've obtained statements from, as the state already indicated, they were wondering why some witnesses changed their testimony 36 hours after the robbery. Uh, I think I have uh, some basis in regards to some of the witnesses that I've taken statements from in order to not disclose some of the defenses that I have. I've withheld some of those affidavits. I did provide an affidavit which the state also agrees uh, that this individual was present at the scene. Uh, he gave a statement, a sworn statement to the police saying that uh, this did not occur the way that the uh, alleged victims are indicating it occurred. In fact, the alleged victims, as you know, already gave four affidavits to Mr. Greco saying that, it, and what I thought was most evident in that uh, affidavit was if, if whether or not a, a firearm was used, they don't even say during the course of a robbery, a firearm was used, but Mr. Uh, Dunbar was not involved. Uh, they don't even they don't even say that in that affidavit. They're essentially saying, well, whether or not a, a, a gun a gun was used. So I understand that the court found a, a proof evident presumption. Great judge. Uh, I would be seeking a bond um, in the same uh, token. Uh, for Mr. Baker. I think the uh, 25000 per count, in fact, will even agree to do it on all, all eight counts instead of just four counts, which I think is probably more appropriate for a total of $100,000. But in his case, it would be a total of $200,000 because it would be still 25000 a count. We would agree to the uh, pretrial uh, in, in the same situation. And everything that the, the state has said on the previous case in regards to the actions, the inactions, the the case law that's relevant, uh, I I understand, and uh, you know, to be quite honest with you, I understand his point of view. Even though I think you can still argue that proof, evident, presumption, great can can not be found at a uh, at a first appearance. I understand his case law, and even if I was to uh, subject myself to that same case law and your finding, judge, I think he's still entitled to a bond. Twenty two years old, no criminal history whatsoever, first time ever in. Uh, handcuffs. I was in constant contact with the officer. The officer actually uh, is the detective. Detective Moretti is actually uh, willing to talk to your honor in regards to a bond, but you already set a, a bond in that case, so I don't think it's necessary. But he isn't even a, he was even in agreement to set a bond in this case. So I want to make the record very clear that he was even in agreement to set the, the a bond in this case. Um, when when asked. When, he, when my client was gonna surrender, I told him not only the day he was gonna surrender, but when he got to the jail, I also called the officer said, he's at the jail, he's surrendering uh, now. There is no such, and not to repeat what Mr. Greco said so eloquently, but uh, there, there was no other corroborating evidence besides what um, is, is, is in that uh, affidavit judge, that, that warrant. So I would ask for the same bond judge, uh, $25,000 account for a total of $200,000 standard pretrial conditions. If your honor feels that uh, he should stay in Florida, he should stay in Florida. He plays for the Giants. He's a cornerback for the Giants, as you know, Judge. Uh, I don't know when the NFL is going to start back up, and I don't know if one or others or whoever is going to start back up at the same time that uh, the NFL starts back up. I'm not sure which teams are going to start back up at the same time because New York may have more stringent guidelines than Florida, for example. Uh, so, if it's necessary for him to stay in Florida, he will stay in Florida. He has significant ties here in Florida. Uh, he has a home here in Florida. His parents live here in Florida. And uh, in fact, his extended family, some of them uh, are in law enforcement in Florida. Uh, so we would do the exact same thing, surrender any firearms. He does have a, a carry permit judge. We'll surrender that carry permit 
and any other firearms uh, that are uh, that would be uh, that he has in his possession if he has any. Okay, Mr. Judge, Pass, please, please. Thank you, Your Honor. Just for purposes of laying the record, the state's re uh, relying on Gazaza versus uh, state, which is at 222 Southern 3rd, 42 Florida, weekly D1362. Judge, do you, can you pull up for me, please, the affidavit of Dominic Johnson? Yes, one second. By the way, I, Mr. Cohen, theoretically, I do agree with you. As everyone knows, I was the judge on the Saza case, and uh, I, I do agree that you should not find probable cause at a, uh, at a uh, first appearance hearing, but the fourth DCA does not agree. So I will follow their, uh, I will follow their lead. Until you get to the fourth DCA, Judge. Until, right, until I get on the fourth DCA, exactly. Hey, hey, judge, and I just want to make clear that uh, in the affidavit that I ha have signed, that I presented, I mean, I have several affidavits, but I'm not presenting them at this time. But in that affidavit, that's the individual who they stated was friendly with both parties and that he gives a, a consistent statement with the police that nothing occurred. And just that alone, to be quite honest with you, uh, it really rubs in the face of proof evident presumption great because it's not even included in the warrant that there was a, an independent witness that said none of this actually happened. Uh, but in that, in that affidavit, Judge, um, there are several uh, paragraphs. Uh, it, is a, it is a standard affidavit in that we add in um, and when I say we attorneys, uh, usually add in that, uh, witnesses, uh, that obtain affidavits through other attorneys, which in this case, it appears that he obtained an affidavit through other parties. Um, we add in there typically that, uh, they are, uh, represented by counsel and that if they need to schedule an affid a future hearing, if they need to be contacted for deposition, uh, I think this goes towards not only the state attorney's office, but also for defense counsel, uh, that they should contact their counsel in order to do that. And as the state alluded to earlier, I think the purpose for those paragraphs in this affidavit is possible threats, possible intimidation tactics, possible things like that. So that's why I think that witnesses in high profile cases often get, uh, get uh, attorneys. And uh, I think that the reason for that is exactly what I just said, Judge. I think they got obtained attorneys. They don't want to talk to the state without those attorneys because they don't know what the state's motivation is. Not to say this state attorney is not an honorable guy. I, I like him too. But, uh, but long story short is most witnesses don't know what state's uh, motivations are if they really want to get rid of a case and listen to a witness or if they feel they're setting them up for something in the future or something like that if it's an inconsistent statement. So most witnesses in high profile cases, and I've had quite a few, uh, Judge, uh, most witnesses will discuss uh, with their attorney or hire an attorney for the purposes of that because they don't want to be bothered by the press. They don't want to be bothered by defense attorneys. They don't want to be bothered by the state attorney. They are independent witnesses that generally get 10 to 20 calls a day on high profile cases from not only the news sources, but from state attorneys that are worried possibly that their case is falling apart and need something. And they wanna reach out and contact these individuals to try and not exculpate people, but try to inculpate people, try to figure out why they are guilty and not not guilty. So witnesses generally get attorneys in high profile cases. And I know that, uh, and I can say that from, from personal knowledge. So if that's what we're gonna point out in this, that you know he hired an attorney and you have the warrant in front of you judge that he doesn't want to talk to the state attorney's office going forward he wants to go through his attorney that's for me typical in a lot of um high profile cases not just in florida but cases i've handled in, in uh, california and new york um i've had several witnesses that i've never had contact with i never spoke to uh often file file affidavits that say hey i don't want to talk to anybody you talk to my attorney and when it's time to give a statement, I'll give a statement. So if that's what we're pointing out, I can kind of cut it off at the pass and just address it. Judge, if I may. Please, Mr. Pesci. That's not what the state wishes to address. Um, does your honor have the affidavit up? Yes, this is for Mr. Um, um, Johnson. Johnson, it's two pages and yes. the, back, the back has his passport attached. Yes, Judge, I have that one up. Judge. I want you to consider this uh, and how the state's viewing this. Three men, three separate cars. Okay, three men, three separate cars, all park 
in a way to which they can get out and make a quick exit. That's okay. That's what we know. One of the men is in a red mask. We don't know. We can't, we haven't identified that person, right? That's the person giving, getting orders from either Baker or Dunbar to go ahead and to, at one point, shoot somebody that was entering the home, which makes sense that the man in the mask would be the shooter. Here, here's what's important. Do you have the affidavit up? I do. I'm looking at it. Okay. At some point, there was an argument. I'm referring to Clause 3, Your Honor. At some point, there was an argument that arose between some of the parties that were playing the dice game. I was never in fear for my life in any situation that happened that day, and DeAndre Baker did not take any property from me and did not appoint a gun at anyone. So what he's actually recognizing, this friend, and, and Your Honor, remember, it's a house, okay? There's 15 to 20 people, um, you know, it's a house. These, these gentlemen are known at this, at this house by the parties that are there. This, this gentleman, Mr. Johnson, um, states either to a detective at some point that they grew up together and that they, they're well known, they're friends. Okay, so now they have a friend who in clause three, and I'll only focus on clause three, who in clause three isn't denying that there was an incident. In fact, all he's saying, Judge, is that he wasn't in fear. And I ask Your Honor, if your friend had a gun, you, you may very well not be in fear because that's your friend. And he's not currently robbing you. He's not a listed victim. So why would he be in fear? The affidavit is very vague when it speaks to those points. It's not saying, hey, I can test or that's that's not what's there. Dunbar and Andre weren't there or they didn't. They, there wasn't an argument that didn't ensue and that there wasn't a gun involved by one of the parties or that there weren't threats by one of the parties or that they didn't run out all three of them together. That's not in here. All that's in there is that he, in fact, was not in fear of the situation, that Baker did not take any property from me. He said me. That's very specific, Judge. From me and did not point a gun at anyone. So, Your Honor, um, we would ask that within the four corners of the, comp of the probable cause affidavit, which has four different victims, all alleging that DeAndre Baker had a gun and that had committed this act, um, that your honor find within those four corners proof, evident, presumption, great. And even if your honor were to step outside like your honor did in Mr. Dunbar's case to those four victims recanting, they only recant as to Mr. Dunbar. Well, they don't yeah. recant as to Mr. Baker. So well, your honor, we would ask that you find proof, evident, presumption, great and hold uh, Mr. Baker uh, on a no bond hold for the first four counts of the indictment and uh, the same monetary bonds on the other four counts as that was previously held with the co-defendant, Mr. Dunbar. All right, I, I must move on. So, so let me make my rule, but let me just correct one thing, Mr. Passy. Uh, I'm, I'm actually in this case gonna make the same ruling as I did in the old case, old case in the previous case. I don't believe I'm stepping outside the four corners of the affidavit in terms of making the finding of proof evident presumption great under Isaza. However, the finding does not mean that I have to hold these gentlemen no bond. The fourth did not say that. So I will release him on a $25,000 bond per count, standard pretrial, no firearms, weapons. We know that he has a concealed firearms permit, so he doesn't have to surrender that within 48 hours and any weapons, ammunition, et cetera, within 48 hours of release. No contact with any alleged victims in the case for Mr. Uh, for Mr. Um, Baker. Um, and again, Mr. Baker, as I said to, as I, I'm sorry, I just got another affidavit. It was the same one twice. Yeah, same as, one. as I said to um, your co-defendant, um, this does not mean that the state attorney won't uh, potentially file a motion to have you held uh, without bond pre-trial. That's going to be up to the state attorney's office. For today's purposes, though, I will release you on that monetary bond. Now, Mr. Um, Cohen, he owns a home also in South Florida? Uh, he does, Judge. All right. So I'm going to issue the same order that he not leave the state at this time. If there comes a time that he has to travel for work purposes to a New York or to another state, I'll leave that up modifiable by the division, Judge. Thank you, Judge. All right. And, All right. and Both, Judge, uh, we would also act, ask Judge uh, yeah. respectively to say no contact with any victim or witness, direct or indirect of any sort. Um, unless, of course, you know, it's Mr. Cohen trying to speak to the witnesses. We have no objection right. to that, Judge. Of course. 
Of course, yes, that should be added. Cassie having hung up in his office. Really and also, uh, pre-trial, uh, Michelle, same uh, requirement. He can, he can, uh, he can check in by phone. That's fine. Unless there's a, unless there's a concern, unless he's fallen out of contact, he can check in by phone. You got it, Judge. Got it, Your Honor. Thank you. All right. Great Judge. job, everyone. Nice Thank to see you. Judge, all. I didn't. Thank you, Mr. Pass. Did Mr. Cohen say? I didn't. I didn't hear Mr. My uh, Zoom is was in and out. Uh, did Mr. Cohen? Did, did he ask me for an order? No, I said that you have nothing hanging on your walls. It looks very barren in there. <laughs> Thanks, Judge. And Mr. Thank Cohen, you so what's your first name? Thanks. My first. Mr. Cohen, what's your first name for the record? Bradford Cohen. You can call me Brad. Thank you. All right. All right. Very good. Let's move on. There was. Uh, we